Arnold. <laughs> it's great to finally have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Your, it's a pleasure. So Arnold, you, you seem very laid back as well as low key, <laughs> <laughs> but you are the brains behind uh, two powerful organizations, which is Mifri Ghana and Future of Ghana. That's very humbling to hear. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say I'm the only brains. There's a number of us behind it, but um, yeah, we, we are pioneering something that we hope will be around for generations. Looking at how both of them have become, did you envisage this when you conceived this idea? Uh, no, is the simple answer. Because it stemmed from an identity crisis, Mifri Ghana that is. It was around a time when I was in university mm -hmm. and coming to Ghana independence I wanted to express my identity as a British-born Ghanaian. So the formulation of the vision that God gave me for Mifri Ghana in terms of the, the t-shirts and the jumpers at the time, that's what it was. It was something that was personal, personal to me. But I didn't realise that this thing that was personal to me, this identity crisis I was going through, was something that so many others were actually experiencing at the time as well. But then over a course of time, as the influence grew, you have to start to plan. Yeah. So. Did you know a lot about Ghana then? No. Nah. No? <laughs> no. Nah. Do you it's, speak the local dialect? I speak it a little bit. You know, I get away with it, but sometimes I trip over certain dialects and ways of expression, depending on who you're speaking to, whether it's the Ga or the, the Ewe or the or the, the kind of tree and everyone speaks the, the local language. Um, I'm talking about the tree language yeah. a bit differently depending on where you're from. Yeah. If they do speak it as well. Speaking of identity, do you, do you think that's what was missing, would you say? Uh, identity is multifaceted. Yeah. People connect with Ghana in different ways. It could be through language, it could be through food, it could be through music, it could be through sport. And at the time we started it, Mifri Ghana clothing that is, it was sports, no it was music, the music culture and I think that a lot of organisations like in the UK like Aquaba and West Coast Entertainment were really pioneering in bringing the Ghanaian community together through entertainment. So f entertainment in the sense of music, that was really something that, that kind of allowed me as an individual I would say to kind of connect. And even my brother, he was in, he was doing Mr. Ghana when they, when the Kwaba did Mr. and Mrs. Ghana. So, you know, I always had some kind of a connection. Because back then, some people were not really identifying themselves with Ghana, shying away from being African. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that. Yeah. I think we should bring some, some historical kind of, um, take people on the journey. Yeah. yeah? So Mifri Ghana started as an idea, as a project in 2007. 2008 it kind of came out towards the end in December and around that time 2007 2008 what was going on it was um Ghana in 2006 actually is the World Cup mm. and that's when Ronaldo made our goalkeeper look like he, he wasn't even <laughs> he wasn't even meant to be a goalkeeper yeah. did a few step overs mm. and he was injured at that time you know, I just remember being at Choice FM weekend uh, watching that game with some of my boys and thinking, oh, Ghana, they're actually doing all right. They're not doing too badly. So it was the sports culture. But at that time, it was really about, in the UK I'm talking about, it was really about the, the Caribbean abashment scene that was really making headway. Mm. Um, if you go even further back, I'm talking about when I was in school in the early noughties, no, when is it? Yeah, 98 to 2003. It was not cool to be an African in school yeah. at all. There was no, you know, Afrobeats. There was no high life really that was mainstream that you could connect with. Um, the food culture, you weren't really taking jollof to, to school, you know, for, yeah. for lunch. Do you know what I mean? You, you, really, you really had your sandwiches and your, your Twix bars and that was it. You weren't embracing the food culture, the music culture. And, you know, you're getting dragged to events, whether it be funerals or parties mm -hmm. and associations, but I think the disconnect was our parents weren't really, well, I know 
it was they were but they weren't really explaining why we were going to these community events mm. so for us it was more about just cracking the supermall and having that and then take us on home <laughs> that's how you yeah. know the culture was really identified then moving back from school to you know i'll say the day that Mr. Ghana kind of started in terms of the, the clothing, there wasn't really too many connection points other than 2006, the World Cup, where Ghana were playing okay. Mm. But then 2008, when Mr. Ghana kind of started um, to gain a lot of attention, it was around the time where Ghana itself was holding the African Cup of Nations. And I was fortunate enough to actually go to Ghana at that time. And that's when I had a real, let's say, epiphany or this that aha kind of moment where I really had that chance to explore Ghana f for myself when I went there with my brother but it was it was a euphoric kind of atmosphere and this culture and it's this color and music and it's a togetherness and the black stars did so well you know a go 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 and all those kind of phrases were yeah. flying around at the time and Ghana could have, should have won. And that's when you had Suleiman Tari, you had um, Essien, Epier. He was kind of injured, but playing. Do you know what I mean? So there was this real, we had the best midfield in the world, I would say. Um, so we went from the, the kind of music culture in the UK, and then I got to experience the sports culture actually in Ghana. Um, and then you go to 2010, when it's the World Cup. Yeah. And you see that there's been a big shift from 2006 to 2010 mm -hmm. when Ghana really and truly should be World Cup winners. So the sports culture, we don't want to talk about Suarez, yeah. don't worry. <laughs> but there's been a real shift. Yeah. And that shift in music and culture becoming more mainstream mm -hmm. and more globally recognised has shifted in terms of people's ability to accept and embrace the identity. And speaking of you going back to Ghana with your brother, that wasn't the first time, was it? No, the first time was, I think it was 95. And when I first went back... Is it not what you expected it to be? <laughs> I was like nine. Yeah. And um, when we went back, it was, was it Ghana Airways? I don't think it was Ghana Airways. But I just remember the plane being crap. No. <laughs> the reason, Maybe it was Ghana the reason, Airways then. Ah, Charlie, trust me. I don't think it was crap because of... It was crap for me at that time because... The main, thing, the main thing was I remember there was one TV screen that everyone watched the film on. Oh. And I was thinking, I'm nine years old, I can't even see this. So I'm now going to be on a plane for what, seven hours with nothing. So for me, that was, just, it wasn't really good. That was a good way to start the holiday. Yeah. Then I arrived and it was hot, it was stuffy. Like I said, it wasn't cool to be African, African. Ghanaian at that time. So I wasn't really embracing the culture. Mm. The only foods I ate were probably jollof with some, some meat and then chicken. If, the, if jollof, chicken or meat was not involved, I wasn't really eating Easy. yam and, you know, contomre and... No. So that, that first trip was a big culture shock. The second time I went was, I believe, 2005 with my family again. And that's the first time we all went. And that... I remember, I still remember, I see it and I feel it. I remember the time I was driving back with my dad. We just came back from Edramakasi and saw the compound houses that he lived in and that my mum lived in. And they were neighbours, but they didn't live there at the same time, kind of. But the families knew each other. And I was just thinking, I said to my dad, I said, I basically said, I rate you. <laughs> because to come from a village town in Kumasi, to have the idea to then go to Accra, pursue your teaching, to think about getting on a plane to a country that was kind of institutionally racist at the time, yeah. the UK, never been here before, and to set up, make a pathway for my mum to come, and you could say immigrants, but you know, they, they came here to work. Yeah. Because um, I think the stigma of immigrants is, you know, just come and just feed off the system. But no, they came, they worked, they set up um, a life, a platform for myself, my brother, my sister. Yeah. So to, to look, to go to Ghana at that time, to see where they came from, and my mind always processes things. That's when I kind of had this realisation that, no, nah, I'm standing on their shoulders. They've done so much, they've sacrificed so much. What am I doing? for myself, my generation, 
to further what they've started. And I think my parents are not in isolation because a lot of first generation Ghanaians that have come to the UK or Belgium or France or US, wherever they go, they've sacrificed. They took a step of faith and they, they tried, you know, and everything was new. The way they parent, yeah. the way that they speak, um, the, 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 the way they interact with people, you know, mm -hmm. you're sitting at a table, like in Ghana, not all of, not all families sit together, you know, some, especially back in the day, the dad wouldn't even sit in the same room, you know, or the, the husband or wife, they'll sit in a separate room, yeah. you know, it's, it's different. And now you come to this country where children have a voice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so changed. all of these things are going through my mind. And I just said to dad, I said, you know what, thank you. And that was, again, the start of a journey. But then in 2008, when, like I said, I came for the African Cup of Nations, or I went for the African Cup yeah. of Nations, and I went with my brother. Um, what was very interesting about that journey is that we realised how cheap tickets were. So we were like, oh my God, we're going VIP all the way, all the way, all the way. We did VIP for the first game, and we're like, this is dead. Like, no one's celebrating. Like, yeah. what's everyone doing? And we're like, no, forget that. We're going to be with the crowd. And that was just amazing. Awesome. It was amazing. But that journey allowed us to experience Ghana ourselves. Oh, so let's talk about your organisations, Mifri Ghana and Future of Ghana. What are the objectives? So Mifri Ghana, like I said, it started off as a, it was registered as a company mm. and we started off with the clothing. But I realised 2012, 13, 14, that as much as it was registered as a company, a lot of what we were doing was charitable. So in 2012, we registered a charity called Wham Campaign, mm. because between 2010 to 2014, again, we realised that there was an influx of young people going to Ghana at Christmas time, but everyone was going to, you know, like I think at the time it was Boomerang or if Afrikiko, so nighttime <laughs> activities, yeah. right? But during the day, people weren't really doing much, mm. so we set up volunteering programmes. Between 20, probably 2013 to 2015, all of the products and services that we were offering through Mifri Ghana, this shifted it over to Wham Campaign. Mm -hmm. So as I speak today, Mifri Ghana, you don't really see too much about it because I use it specifically, exclusively as an advisory company, oh, okay. where we support companies within the EU that want to set up or mar gain market entry opportunities into Africa. So now, present day, Future of Ghana is now the charity. And the reason we did that is because we realised that Future of Ghana was a powerful brand name and it was gaining a lot of attention because the first project that we moved with was the Top 30 Under 30 project. The Top 30 Under 30 project was, or is, and nominations are open now actually, yeah. and closed the 1st of December actually, 2018. But um, it's about identifying Ghana's present future leaders. Who are Ghana's top 30 to 30 young people globally, around the world? Where are they, what are they doing? How are they impacting their communities and industries? Yeah. And the reason we started that project um, was because we recognised that you look at so-called great institutions like Cambridge, Oxford, Yale, Harvard, the backbone of these organisations or institutions is their alumni. How are we cultivating our own alumni yeah. to support economic development back home? So now, in 2019, it will be our fifth year since we started our project. So Future of Ghana has a vision of seeing a first world self-sustaining Ghana mm -hmm. where young people are placed at the centre of development. Okay. It's very simple. And the reason we speak about young people is because the continent, 60% are under the age of 25, even Ghana is like 65, 70% are under the age of 30 or so. But there are population that are not really being engaged effectively. And when we talk about a growing middle income country yeah. or growing middle income um, group within the continent and within, within Ghana specifically, it is the youth. Absolutely. But no one's addressing them. You know, and then you take them and you take the diaspora youth, you, like you've got a, a, such a beautiful skill set that, that just need to be mobilised and that just need to be 
brought together through the top 30 under 30 projects. People can now volunteer in Ghana through credible organisations that have been vetted. Um, and I they received can contribute. an email. Pardon? <laughs> I received an email. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, it went out this week, right? <laughs> Yeah, Irene's doing amazing. So, it's a very yeah. great idea. Also, being able to recognise people's hard work is, is mm. very good. And you always have publications, isn't it? You publish it. Yeah, so the Top 30 project is not just about identifying, but it's about positively promoting it as well. And the majority of our audience are you know, millennials, so digital. So we do digital publications, but we're going to start doing print publications as well now. So what have you learned from since becoming an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur? What would you say? What, what are the challenges? What have you learned? Hindsight is a beautiful thing. Being able to look back, and I, I think we were speaking before, and I said it takes about 10 years to really evaluate whether something, whether what you're doing is going to be impactful or is, in, is creating impact. And I think there's... God is just amazing. He's marvellous because, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave myself bare. In 2012, yeah, 2012 Goober Awards, right? Wham campaign was up for the best charity award. Yeah. I went to that award with the team, um, that team, the team at the time, and I remember thinking, because we were against Africans who we, who are just a phenomenal. Um, NGO based in Ghana, doing great work in, in the northern region. And I kind of looked up to them as an organisation, but what I realised was that, not what I realised, but what I kind of um, envisioned was we weren't going to win. And that was going to be a great way for me to just say, that's it, I finish now. I don't want to do this no more. Because it's so challenging. Yeah. You know, just left work, and was doing it full time, wasn't getting paid. It was just challenging, so many challenges from going back home, trying to um, you know, do these volunteering projects and the people are working with not really com communicating to you properly and then talking behind your back, even team members talking behind your back. And it's just, it was just too much. And I was what, 22, 23, 24 at the time, something like that. And for me, it was kind of like the last supper. Yeah. And then, who announced it? I think it was Hugh Kwashi. Yeah, Hugh Kwashi announced that Wham campaign won. Mm. And all of the team got up. And in my head, I was like, God, why? Like, I didn't want it. And I remember walking to the stage with the team. All of them, they were all excited. But for me, I walked up there. And it's like, I just remember seeing the hand of God just go like that. Yeah. And everyone just went quiet. And I was just thinking, Okay, cool. But I shared a few words. Um, I don't know what I said. And then I remember go walking around the back and Yah was there. Yah now I go. <laughs> yeah. And she can testify. I just burst into tears. I burst into tears because I didn't want it no more. It was too much, too much to bear. And a, a lady, Benny Bonsu. Yeah. Doing fantastic work in media as well, in yes. basketball. She said something to me at a premiere one time, at Kwaba UK's premiere for um, a film that they brought over here. Again, they're doing fantastic work. And she said to me, what are you doing in this country? You've got one of the most influential brands in the UK. And I was like, in my head, I was like, what? I said, I'm just having, we're just having fun. But that's the expectation people have on me? Yeah. So I was like, whoa. <laughs> so those two inc incidents kind of put me in a shell yeah. and I, I tried to run away but I kept on being drawn back in, kept on being drawn back in and that's when kind of re-strategized and went a bit more quiet. I started looking at okay how can we build this so it's sustainable and now I can say that did that so that when we come out like we are now we have solid foundation that I don't want no one else to have to experience that. Yeah. Because people say, oh, that's mental health, that's depression, that's all of those things. And I was depressed, do you know what I mean? But I was depressed in a good way because there was an expectation. Um, but it's, it's realising that too much is given, much is expected. Yeah. So yeah, the journey's been interesting. It's been worth the while, isn't it? It always pays off, doesn't it? 
Oh, it does. You've held a couple of events where you've had people that have gone back home and come back and shared your story with us. And the, one of the things that they do touch on is networking. Tell us how important it is to network. I feel like this is a history lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Probably 2006, myself, Samuel Kosumu, and a few other young people at university, we started something called Elevation Networks. And we started that because we realised that, um, well, Samuel the visionary realised he was the president, I was vice president of ACS. Mm -hmm. And when we started interacting with some of the Russell group, like elite kind of universities in London, or not in London, but you know, in the UK, we recognised that they were able to get sponsorship like that. Right. Whereas we went to Bruno University, which was not Russell Group University, mm -hmm. and we struggled, but we had the largest population of black and minority ethnic, or well, African Caribbean students, part of our society. So we saw there was a discourse. Mm. So to answer your question, the tagline of Elevation Networks was know who, know how. Because we realised it's not just what you know, it's who you know. No. And I think what, and I was talking to my wife about this as well, we need to just humanise relationships. I'll give you an example. I was privileged to win the Africa, India Africa Award and I was flown to Davos for the World Economic Forum to present about Mifri Ghana and mm. what we were doing with Wham campaign. And one of the, the, the sessions. And I remember I walked, we just arrived. So it, if people don't understand, Davos is in the mountains in Switzerland. It's snowing, it's cold. And I sat near the back and everyone was still arranging the room. And they were sat next to an uh, elder gentleman, a white man, gray hair. And I'll never forget, he was sat there like this, with his tea and his drinking. Quite a long story short, and this is the power of networking, right? I spoke to him and he was the founder of Skype. <laughs> just sitting there in the corner. And we just started talking. I just talked to him like, ah, oh, so what do you expect from what you want to do here? What do you do? Just talking. And no, actually, I started talking to him about tea, because I love tea. Yeah. And I said, what kind of tea is that? You know, and that's what I mean about humanising, mm. humanising conversations. When you are comfortable in your own skin, you can have genuine conversations with people, you realise that networking, which is really conversations, it becomes more lucid, it becomes more free. It's all about having great relationships. It is. Like, how long have I known you and Jones for? Like, for years. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, I, think, I think even Jones, I, I wanted, can I turn around? Uh, Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I think John, I think you filmed the first Wham campaign press launch. And I know you and your team are doing amazingly well. And it's been great talking to you. Thank I you. I finally so much. got you on my show. Yeah. <laughs> Hope to see you soon. Yeah.